There's a place where people go to get away, to hide, to go missing. It's in the woods. The most terrifying hour in 11 minutes you will ever experience from your chair. The woods. It could be the water, the trees, or something lurking, watching, and waiting in the woods. The woods. You will beg for mercy in the woods. The woods. There's something terribly wrong in the woods. Oh my god, do not go in the woods. We recommend admittance to no one under 17 to the woods. The woods. Yeah, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the film attorney, and my client has a case. Take off your clothes. I don't like women giving me orders. I spit on your grave. During the early era of slasher films in the 1980s, never was there a film more despised by critics, namely Siskel and Ebert and the Motion Picture Association, than Mayor Zarki's I Spit on Your Grave, a rape-revenge exploitation film also known as Day of the Woman. To give a brief synopsis of the plot, a woman takes bloody revenge on four men who leave her for dead after brutally gang-raping her for the entire first half of the film. And on a school night, too. Many claim that the movie is nothing more than violent pornography that celebrates rape and violence towards women. And that is all provably not true, as I will demonstrate as we watch... I spit on your grave. So the film begins with the main character, Jennifer, leaving the city to vacation in the country and write her first novel. Along the way, she stops to get gas from Johnny, who's almost ready to open up that roadside attraction he's always been dreaming about. Looking for fun and excitement while enjoying the blessed beauty of the Housatonic River? Then stop at Johnny's Gas and take a tour of Johnny's Rape Trail. Get some exercise and enjoy the forest as nature intended, naked, bloody, and covered in mud. Find romance with one or even all four of our handsome tour guides. Enjoy live music while getting a nice face massage from the loving knuckles of one of our trained relaxation specialists. On Johnny's Gasoline and Rape Trail, located on Route 7 in Kent, Connecticut. And Jennifer arrives at her summer house, engages in a brief scene of absolutely unnecessary nudity. Pointless nudity. I don't know why you're complaining about this, huh? Yeah, number. I got, I got a fellow you need to talk to. I'm going to go ahead and write you a prescription for two testicles, and you feel free to get this filled out whenever you want. This is the only enjoyable bit of nudity that there is in this movie. And Mayor Zarki decided that it would be a better idea than giving us close-ups of her cans and backstroke to shoot the scene from the other side of the lake in the middle of the goddamn woods. And her nudity in this scene is not really sexual, it's more innocent. Because she's alone. And now we meet Matthew, the only borderline case. I know this is a character we're supposed to pity in a way, like many characters that Woody Allen and Rick Moranis play, but considering what I've seen this person do during this movie, there is no pity coming from me. I'm not sure Matthew was supposed to be pitied. We know he's not playing with a full deck, but he's not Rain Man retarded either. Matthew's role in this film is to show the choice to rape someone be made. He refuses the first turn because he doesn't want to do it. He obviously knows it's wrong. He tries to console her after the first rape, but she ain't having it. And when they're cheering him on, you can see the conflict in his face. He does want to do it. Now, when Matthew signs his own death notice is when he does give in to his own temptations and their peer pressure and attempts to rape her. And he does overcompensate a little bit. So we see Matthew develop a little crush on her. He leaves the house and swings by the gas station to report on seeing her tits. This gets Stanley and Andy interested, so they swing by for a look. I 
know these two are supposed to be the stupid ones in the bunch, but is this really what they see as effectively attracting a girl? Sadly, yes. Men in parking lots do this all the time. They just kick the gas pedal over and over again, revving the engine. Also, this serves another purpose, to stake out the location. What's the layout like? Is she alone? Is she with her parents? Is she with a man? Does she have a dog? Does she have a gun? These are all things you need to know before you commit a crime like bank robbery or gang rape in this case. Now Cisco and Ebert felt that this film encourages rape. What kind of skeletons are hiding in their closets? I've seen this movie quite a few times and I have never ever sympathized with the gang rapists. In fact, every time I see it, I find new reasons to hate them. Like when Andy mocks her novel and uses her own writing to justify what he's doing to her. Who made love to her? Oh, the men who made love to her. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. Now, apparently, Roger Ebert drew this conclusion because a bunch of guys in the theater were yelling things at the screen that kind of sounded like they were encouraging the rape. I went to see I Spit on Your Grave, and I was sitting next to a fairly nicely dressed middle-aged man, maybe in his 50s or 60s, who was talking back to the screen with lines like, boy, she's really asking for it now, or, you know, there's a rape scene coming up, this will be a good one, and so forth. This guy is, to my way of thinking, a vicarious sex criminal. Guys are yelling at the screen because this scene is a downer, and it's only a movie. And laughing at this horrible imagery is really just a defense mechanicism to keep it from affecting them. I wouldn't consider this anything to worry about. Look at this guy. That I would worry about. Now accusations that this film encourages rape are ridiculous. This scene is not sold as anything sexy or erotic. It plays like the documentation of a rape more than a reenactment. And there's no musical score to guide your feelings as to how you're supposed to feel at every moment. And if watching this makes you feel uncomfortable, good. That's how you are supposed to feel if you see or witness a gang rape, real or imaginary. Mayor Zarki wanted you to hate these guys, absolutely hate them. Roger Ebert said he was disturbed by the fact that the rapists were obviously not deranged. To make these guys deranged, or the victim of some kind of traumatic event, would only serve as an excuse for an inexcusable act. So why did they do it? They're yeah, stupid. Exactly. <laughs> Just listen to this conversation. These gorgeous looking chicks. I mean, the ones that look like real knockouts. Sexy and all. And I wonder. I wonder if they gotta take a shit too. Now, I must admit that I do really love Matthew's contribution to this dialogue. Hey, all women shit. Women are full of shit. Not my mother. Zarki has been quoted saying he was inspired to do the film after helping a young woman who had been raped in New York. Though this has been continually declared factual, I do not see this as an homage to that woman, nor do I see this as a film for female empowerment. Maybe it's neither one of those things. Artists tend to make art to exercise their own demons. And maybe in this case, those demons happen to be the rage he felt towards the men who raped that lady. Hearing a rape victim give testimony in a courtroom is a lot different than seeing one actually walk out of the bushes naked and beat up. And maybe that's what he was trying to convey in this 40-minute gang rape. He wanted you to feel the anger he felt towards these men before having you indulge in his fantasies of them getting what he felt they deserved. And while many debate whether or not the death penalty is an appropriate punishment for murder, I've never heard anyone say that this wasn't the appropriate punishment for rape. Oh, God! 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 Now, some say that the revenge portion of this film is weak in comparison to the rape portion. 
And that's true if you just take the deaths at face value. But this is a woman, and they like to go for the psychological jugular. The only one who gets off light in this is Andy. But these two never leave each other's side. They're like bulk and skull. <laughs> So having to take out two at a time means one of them is getting a lesser punishment. Now Stanley, on the other hand, you remember what his thing was. And that's the position he ends up in when he's hanging on the outboard motor of his own boat begging for his life. Johnny! Johnny taught me to do it! Johnny made me do it! I didn't want to do it! He made me do it! Suck it, bitch. <gasps> Let's move on to Matthew. Like I said earlier, Matthew was the only borderline case. But he's also a good practice kill. Now, why would she let him have sex with her? Well, the whole point of the gang rape was for Matthew to lose his virginity. So she gives him what he wanted at the cost of his life. Now, Matthew will never understand the irony of that. But Jennifer does, and I think that's all that counts. Now, one thing everyone says, and I agree, is that Johnny should die last. Not just because he's the head bad guy, but because this really is the climax of the movie. So how does Johnny end up in her bathtub? Okay, here's what this idiot does. Jennifer pulls into the gas station, so he gets in the car and she drives into a remote spot in the woods. Now this makes sense. He may get to finish what Matthew chickened out of. So then he finds himself naked at gunpoint. So how do you get from here to her bathtub for a castration scene? This is the most flawed piece of writing in this movie. Fortunately, Aaron Tabor is an excellent actor. Sarkis' writing calls for this character to do some really stupid things, but he does them with confidence and completely sells it. But Don, you coax a man into doing it to you, and a, a man gets the message fast. Look, whether he's married or not, a man is just a man. Now, I believe that he believes that he turned this situation completely around. Just look at how this guy thinks. He doesn't like women giving him orders, thinks they should just do whatever they're told. He has three lackeys that hang around him that does whatever he tells them. And he thinks all women are sluts. I'm my mother. But once in the bathtub, she takes her time putting up her hair and asking him questions about his wife and kids. Having him reflect on his own life before losing Snakey and bleeding to death. It's a cheap knockoff of Last House on the Left that extended its two and a half minute rape scene by 40 goddamn minutes. Not really. However, Last House on the Left is a ripoff of Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring. But let's compare the two films for just a minute. Last House on the Left also has a brutal quarter of the film rape sequence that's far more brutal and cruel than I spit. Only Mayor Zarky didn't have subplots. He didn't cut away from the rape to show you an Abbott and Costello routine where two bumbling cops are trying to catch a ride on a chicken truck. If you tell any of the boys at the lodge about this, I'm going to fix your family. Last House on the Left also had a castration scene that was far more ridiculous than the one in I Spit. In Last House, where the parents take revenge, the mother removes the appendage with her teeth. Something that is not only unnecessary, because his hands are already tied behind his back, it's completely out of character for this character. Why not one good violent squeeze, twist, and yank on the old beanbag? Not only would it be a hundred times more painful, just as deadly, but it wouldn't require having a sex criminal bleed into your mouth. Even in terms of exploitation films, this movie is scum. Now, not liking this film is perfectly understandable. It's not a very pleasant movie, it's not something you want to put on to entertain the kids at Christmas time. But to try and have this movie banned is evil. Especially in America, where our freedom of speech and freedom of expression are our most sacred right. Now we make common sense exceptions for things like child pornography and snuff films. I Spit on Your Grave is neither. Camille Keaton did not do this role at gunpoint. In fact, she married Mayor Zarky after the movie was done filming. So obviously, she was not too upset about what she went through in the filming of this movie. Outside of being a daring project for Zarky and these five actors, 
four of which never worked again. There's a few things to be said for this film. A lot of great cinematography. This shot of Camille Keaton laying on this rock could have been a painting. This is also a very beautiful shot here. Also, Keaton deserves a lot more credit for this film, as she does the best screen in the entire genre of exploitation and horror films, if not movies in general. <laughs> Cisco and Niebuhr hated this film, but I'm not sure these guys are a credible source for what to watch, especially Cisco. Here's a short list of films Siskel gave a thumbs down to. Evil Dead, Silence of the Lambs, Reservoir Dogs, From Dusk Till Dawn, Predator, The Big Lebowski. Doesn't exactly have his thumb on the pulse of the audience, does he? And even the thumbs up he gave to Jurassic Park was begrudging. But I guess you can't argue the awesomeness of the T-Rex. <laughs> to see a film or not see a film is fine, but to ban it, to tell me as an audience member I'm not allowed to see it because it is inappropriate material for me to view is censorship. And let's not forget what the late great Mark Twain said about censorship. Censorship is telling a man he cannot have a steak because a baby can't chew it. I'm the film attorney and for now the defense rests.